Thank you. Thanks for that great introduction and a warm welcome. So nice to be here with so many friends. I mean, it's such a great group of people. Nice to see you from all over the country. It's really nice. Um, I actually started this this morning at, because I I wanted to talk about just some different issues that I've been thinking about. And I thought since I was kind of going a little bit off my usual script, I would follow the advice of a friend of mine who said that whenever you go to do public speech, speeches, make sure you watch, wash your feet really well in the morning because you're going to put your foot in your mouth at some point. <laughs> so, so I did take care this morning, so hopefully I won't, you know, I won't, I won't, I won't have this problem. But uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about seven things that just kind of, that I think about a lot, or things that just kind of come up. And um, some, of them, some of them may be relevant to what you guys think about, some may not, but they're things that are on my mind. And um, yeah, so just kind of bear with me on it. I, the, the, the first one I think is probably a little bit, you know, everybody's a little tired of this first one because, you know, you hear it all the time. I, I'm assuming you do. Like, the question about, you know, whether social and community-engaged work is art. Is it art? It's like, you know, you hear that so much. Most people get tired of it, but it's been something that's been sticking with me for a long time. And, um, and I just, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, um, it's an image of work that I used to do when I first started. I was doing paintings and sculptures that dealt with political and social issues. And, um, and on the cover of one of the Houston magazines, there's an image of uh, these cutout sculptures and things dealing with police brutality. And the caption under it says, uh, uh, says something like, artists, when artists are dealing with issues, are they making art or making points? So even back, you know, before I started doing social and community engaged work, I mean, I always had people that were kind of challenging um, my, uh, whether I was really being an artist or making art or not. So I'm accustomed to that, so I think about it all the time. And, I, you know, so I always kind of think about ways to play around with it, to see how I fit within this context. And so, th so this is, this is one thing that I've been kind of playing around with a little, and some of you might have seen this presentation if you did this before, but I'll just, just play along with me. I'm sure you guys recognize this work, right? Anybody recognize this work? Ryan's Clyde. Who said that? Okay, good. All right. Very good. All right, how about this one? Andrean. All right. So, you know, I mean, you know, you see work like this and you just, you know, it's obvious that it has, it, it's obvious that it's art, right? I mean, it's obvious that it has a certain kind of value. But, if you look a little bit closer, yeah, the, the pieces on the top are Franz Kind's. And very valuable work in some museum somewhere. But the pieces at the bottom, of G's Ben's quilts, right? So these were works that were made by, you know, black women in the South, away from the art world, no value whatsoever until someone came along and and, and contextualized them in the art world. And then, uh, and then, and now, you know, uh, well deserving, you know, they, they've been, uh, you know, featured in museums. So that's really, so it's kind of catching up. But at some point, it wasn't considered. Art enough, and then and then in this one, uh, Mondrian. Yes, the bottom two are Mondrians, the middle three, Mondrians, but the top three are actually 1852 pieces by kindergartens, German kindergartens. You know, and so you know, so it took like how many? Some 50 years, 50 plus years before you know this work. That is, um, you know, that that obviously has uh, a kind of value because we, we've legitimized it in the art world. But uh, but at one point, you know, I mean, it was these German kids had no value. So what does that mean? And I, I think it's a real important thing for us to think about, you know, in terms of 
you know, who gets to determine what's art and who, you know, and what's not. And, uh, and for me, it's, it's an important issue, so I think about it all the time. I bumped into this, <coughs> this um, quote from uh, an essay Lucilla Park uh, wrote. And uh, so she was saying that she thinks the task of land art is to focus the landscape that is often too vast for the unaccustomed eye uh, to take in. And, um, and, and actually, you know, it, further along in the article, Lucy talks about the fact that actually land art is city folks. Because, you know, folks who live in the land, they don't need, you know, some kind of art thing to tell them what it is. They, you know, they know what it is. So, but I thought that was interesting, this notion that that, that, that artists can focus on something that can help people see things that they couldn't normally see. So I thought I would play that out a little bit. And I play it out in the context of ready-mades. Duchamp's best ready-mades, right? So if we just set the task of ready-mades is to focus the everyday objects that are often too mundane for the unaccustomed eye to take in, right? I mean, you know, I mean that's pretty much so what he, what he was doing by doing the urinal, you know, it's like, let's place it in a different context so people can see it. And so then I went back and I would take, um, took my iPhone and just kind of Googled urinal, and you get like, just urinals, whatever, but if you Google urinal Duchamp, then all of a sudden you get like this special quality of a urinal, you know, where people are investigating and, and invested in it in a way that you would normally think about, right? So, so that so there's a there's a purpose and a role that artists you know do in kind of like focusing things. So then I thought let's take a little bit further and think about it in the context of social and community engaged art. This is saying that if this purpose is to uh, bring into focus social and community uh, actions that we've lost the capacity to take in, right? Because there's so much stuff that happens all the time around us, and we can't quite focus on that and see it. But what it really is. So, so I did this thing where I said, okay, so since I Googled Urinal Duchamp, let me Google Row House Low and see what happens. <laughs> and then you come up and then you get like this whole kind of other, you know, thing about, you know, what a, um, uh, you know, what a, what a row house could be and its value. That is way different than you, you, you find if you just Google Row House uh, on its own. So I'm very curious about this stuff. Like, who gets to determine what's art and what's not? And, uh, and, and who's making it? Who's not? Where's the value? So then I, I, I look at things like um, my friend Meryl Eupolis, who whose work I truly love and, and, uh, and been inspired by you know, her maintenance work. And, uh, and I understand it. I understand how it works within the art context in the art world. But I also know on the right-hand side, someone that we, um, in our neighborhood, we call him Mr. Bentley. Because this man shows up in front of Project Row Houses, uh, sometimes monthly or you know every other month or so. And he will show up and meticulously uh, manage the, the grass around this bus stop. And sometimes he would be there for seven, eight, nine hours. Sometimes he'll, he'll have a weed eater and other things. Sometimes he'll just have hand shears. And he would just get on his knees and he'd just, he'd work this, he'd work this thing for hours and hours and hours. But he, had, he didn't have anybody, you know, he's not calling up, you know, the museums and the art galleries and papers and stuff to talk about his art. He's just doing it. And it's something that, you know, that I've come to have a deep appreciation for. And I, so, so then when I see, I look for things like this, and I often question for myself, you know, what does this mean? Does this have a value that is beyond what we normally would attribute, it, attribute to it? And what does that value mean in relation to the art world? So then I look at things like this. So on the right-hand side, there's William Pope Elf. Uh, crawling down the street. But then, on the left-hand side, I was walking down the street in Philadelphia one day, and I see this guy walking along 
with this harness red train thing pulling a plastic <coughs> container with a lot of stuff. It was about 35 feet. And he was crossing streets and everything. Everybody, it was a true performance. Everybody had to stop and respond to him. And you know, so what makes these, these things different? I don't know. So, but I, I, will say, I, I, I will say this. I, I, I will say this. You know, Lucy, Lucy goes back at, at, the, at kind of the end of her, her article. She makes this quote here. Uh, for years I've been muttering about my long desire to identify quote unquote social energies not recognized as art. Works erase, but works that erase art world egos and ambitions. What if we had no word for art? Would a whole important area of our experiences vanish or open up? Land art is a good place to test the idea, since land artists often attempt to make their work look as though it is grown, grown there rather than being artificially created. Would art be less artificial if it weren't art? I, you know, I, I often, you know, I think about this quote in the context of these things that I see all the time on the streets, right? I mean, what does it mean without the artificial nature that we bring to things as art? And, and, how, and how does that impact the value of those things? These are just questions. These are things that I think about all the time because, you know, I find that, you know, while many people will say, you know, it's not a big, why are we worried about whether it's art or not? It doesn't matter. But to me, the, the stakes are high. I mean, there are a lot of resources that are attached to this thing that we call art. And there's a lot of power attached to it. Do, are we able to harness that? And, you know, or do we just let it go? Do we just let it slip away? Now, you know, I, I, I don't know if we have the real capacity to talk about whether something is art or not, but we might be able to say whether something's good art or bad art, right? But then, if you do that, then you're probably slipping into the realm of taste. You know, it's like, whose taste is it, you know? And, um, and you know, I can tell you in the early 90s, mid-90s, the work that we're all sitting here celebrating and talking about now was not in the realm or the scope of what the art world considered something that was had value. Uh, this is from an article uh, in the New York Times from an exhibition that I was in at L.A. Mocha, along with um, uh, Marilyn Police and Mel Chen and Kerry Finley and a few other people. And, uh, and you can see the title there. I mean, Roberta Smith, you know, she says, there's a lot to see, and no artwork in, in sight. I mean, you know, what is that saying about, you know, about how, you know, about what people really thought about what it is that was coming to be? I think it's probably only natural because in the beginning of any emerging form, it's probably, uh, you know, it takes time for people's tastes to catch up. Right? It takes a little time for people to kind of figure out what it means and how to, how to value it. So, so that's, that's one area one area of thought that I've been paying, giving a lot of uh, thought to is this thing about what is art. Now, the second thing is kind of leads into that a little bit. But I, I wrote it down as, don't forget to, to thank the enemies. Now, <clears throat> see, this work kind of came out of a, uh, a cultural war of the early 1990s. And, uh, and we, didn't, we, we, we didn't really, you know what, it, it's, it's really interesting that our enemies... As far as I'm concerned, now, I mean, this is where I'm probably sticking my foot in my mouth, right? That somebody's going to go out and say, "Oh my God, Rick Lowe's in there, like praising the conservatives that you know that initiated the culture war." But I will say this: that you know, at the time, you know, I was I was with everyone else, you know, protesting, you know, and supporting uh, freedom of expression and so on and so forth. But you know, at that time. Minority artists, cultural institutions or whatever, were getting very little support. The art world had turned its back 
what had never opened itself up to us. And, uh, and it wasn't until that war started that the art world started trying to, at, at least a part of the art world, started trying to figure out, you know, how do we, how do we stay afloat? I mean, you have people from all camps, you know, basically attacking it for being elitist. And, uh, and at that point, people started looking for ways to justify and to, uh, to look, at, look at art in a different way. So they were looking, and it was mainly artists who were out there in the forefront. And basically, because we were out there anyway doing it beforehand, I mean, before the, before the 1990s, there were already people doing interesting work. I mean, I can go on, I, things that I'm connected to, my lineage is connected to, all the way back to places like St. Elmo's Village uh, uh, in, uh, in LA. You know, and then, of course, just on the other side of the state here, uh, in Philly, Lily Ye was doing the uh, Village of Art and Humanities. Tyree Guyton was in Detroit doing stuff. So there were people doing stuff, but the art world had not, it, its taste had not caught up. And it was in the midst of this cultural war that kind of forced, you know, this new way of, uh, of thinking. So on the one hand, you know, it was, um, it was a, um, a pretty terrible, uh, it was a pretty terrible situation to be in where, you know, you're having to fight for, for things that weren't really necessarily fighting for you. You know, that, that, that's been the case uh, for, you know, quite some time in the art world. And so that's why I think it's important to fight that battle and to claim, you know, what it is that we do in the context, in its rightful context of the arts or in the field of art. Now, I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about going the third one. Now, the third one is a little tricky because I wrote it down as bullshitting and ass kicking. Right. <laughs> now, <clears throat> and, and the reason that I, I did that was because I think of this whole social practice thing as being, there are kind of two sides of it. You know, there's, you know, there's the art side of it, then there's the organizing side of it. Under the organizing um, uh, side of it, there's a lot of asking, right? From the world that I came from. You know, when you're really doing your work in the community, you're probably going to get your ass kicked. You should. Because you can't show up in a new, in a new context and really grasp it completely without, you know, having some experiences. And then on the art side of it is attached this mostly, it's mostly it's a fundraising kind of thing, right? You know, it's, it's conceptual, conceptualizing stuff, which has a tendency to turn into bullshit. Sometimes, right? So you start to bullshitting things about, you know, what what does a project mean? And you make this stuff up. You, and, and it's not all bullshit because it's very valuable. Right? It's very valuable because, because of the layers that we bring to art when we talk about it conceptually. I mean, that's where the value of it comes. But there's a tendency to bullshit there. <laughs> right? So, 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 okay. So when I when I think about you know, my dealings with Project Row Houses. I, you know, I, I was, you know, on the left-hand side here, the image of John Bigger's work that was, that was the point of bullshit for me, right? It was the point in which I could start to, to, to think conceptually about a community building project in a way that departed from what normal community building projects are. So I can start to layer in all this meaning and value, connecting, uh, you know, using the language of building a living John Bigger's painting, and you know, talking about it as a, um, you know, utilizing some of Joseph Boy's bullshit, you know, uh, <laughs> social sculpture <laughs> stuff, in it, right? You know, I mean, I mean, to be quite, I mean, I say that about Joseph Boy's because. To, to be quite honest, I've never really connected with his work, but I connected with the language, and I think the language was way beyond where his work was. This is my opinion, but, but I, 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 my feet are clean. 